welcome to this week's Shannon's Life and Style. Today, my guest is someone who have held position as the CMO of a general practice law firm, the executive director of a patent boutique, national director of legal, and is now the CEO of Sheldon and Steele. Frederick Shelton, thank Frederick. you so much for being here. Thank you so for Frederick, having me. So Frederick, you have been a business and motivational speaker at legal and other professional conventions for over a decade already, right? Correct. And you also recently just got quoted by Forbes magazine. Correct. So tell us about how, you know, what is your life story and how, and how did you get here? Sure. Uh, I started out as a homeless team and it, it was a long story, but it, it was a, a tough, tough story. I used to eat out of garbage cans and... Excuse me, garbage cans? Yeah. Okay. Sleep in the streets, you know. I had people try to set me on fire just for entertainment. People would beat me all the time. It was really hard. Uh, that was your childhood? Uh, teen years. Yeah, yeah. Teen 16, years. around then. So uh, you were homeless? I was homeless and until... Uh, when you're homeless, you go to church, right? Because at church they give out free coffee and donuts, free coffee and donuts, fresh food. So yeah, went to a church and uh, was trying to figure out how I could get as many donuts as I could, and you know, drinking the coffee. And this minister approached me and he said, uh, you know, can we talk? And he learned my situation and asked me if I'd like to go live with him and his family. And I said, sure, you know, and, and of course, I happened the night before I stole a car and slept in it in the parking lot. So the one condition for living with his family was I had to go return the car, which I didn't. I just drove the car about a mile up the street, left the keys in it, and then walked back. Uh, but that got me off the streets until I was old enough to join the Navy. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, I failed at everything. I tried so many jobs, it seemed like I wasn't good at anything. Um, and then I started going to motivational speakers and started listening to books on tape. Back then we had cassettes. And I just hungered and thirsted for knowledge because I knew in my heart I was an intelligent person. Uh, it's just that the world is not egalitarian by nature. We're not all treated equally. We don't all get the same start or benefit or whatever it is. So you have to make your way. Uh, and I learned more and more. And then I started studying things like accounting and business, and I started gathering book smarts. Did you go to school for that, or did you no, just learn on your own? all on my own. Uh, and I started going to Toastmasters, because I wanted to be able to speak and sound like an educated person. And I ended up doing very well. I won the international speech contest up to the district level the first time I tried it. The first time you tried it, yes. and how long did you practice? How long have you been to the uh, I've been going to Toastmasters for over 20 years. Uh, until now? Is yeah, okay. yeah. I, I don't go right now, I'm just so busy with work. I was going up until about a year ago. The people here in Las Vegas in District 33, I think it is, are great people, really good quality people. And I go now more to mentor people. It's about what I can give. Um, the last club that I joined had about six people who would attend every week when I first got there. Okay. Uh, by the time I left my tenure as president of the club, we had about 25 to 30 people who would come every week. So you became uh, the president after you went there so many times and started yeah. participating in their events? Exactly, exactly, okay, yeah. Cool. So, so eventually I uh, started my, my own business. I got into recruiting and I liked it, but I didn't like some of the practices that I saw in recruiting, like any business, whether it's real estate or whatever, there are good examples and bad examples. There are people who are more ethical and people who are, you know, not as ethical as you would like. And at the time, I'd also just seen a movie called Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire, yes. And it was all about, you know, you have to look out for people. And I represented attorneys and, and their career. They, they entrusted their career to me. 
And a lot of times prior to starting my own firm, I would just place them somewhere to collect a commission. Once I started my firm, I made a vow that I would never do that again. Even on our website, if you go to the client page, we tell the people who pay us, you don't come first, the people come first. The, the so you're mainly focused on the people who actually is looking for a career? Correct, correct. So these are going to be seasoned veterans. Uh, I have recruiters who work for me, they'll work with junior attorneys. I only work with senior attorneys, what are called uh, partners or groups, or I'll do law firm mergers and acquisitions. So your main focus is still on the legal area? Absolutely. That's 100% of what, what we do uh, on the recruiting side. Uh, I also get paid to do webinars and speeches, and I do consulting. And you personally hold a legal degree, is that correct? I don't have a high school diploma. Oh, wow. So everything is self-taught? Self-taught, yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've hired people with law degrees, and mm -hmm. some were good, some, mm, no, they should have been lawyers. Well, talking <laughs> about that, because I know that we were talking about street smart, and uh -huh. we were talking about the stuff that we learn at school sometimes are not even applicable in the daily life. Sure. And um, can you actually spread your um, point a little bit more on that? Absolutely. So, uh, I recently wrote an article for Attorney at Law Magazine called How the American Legal education system or how the American education system fails aspiring attorneys and I talked with a friend of mine I know who was the president of George Washington University and another professor and we, we talked about the fact that I used to lecture at the University of San Diego School of Law on how to bring in clients what they call client or business development and when they started letting alumni come to my lectures we couldn't get a big enough room to hold everybody. They were literally sitting on the stairs. And at one point, it occurred to me, and I asked my audience, I said, excuse me, but do they not teach you how to bring clients, how to go get a client in law school? And this kid raised his hand and he said, no, but I can tell you whether or not it's legal to shoot someone who is already falling off a building. And I thought, well, that's gonna come in handy. <laughs> you know, like, how often is that one gonna come up? Uh, and so, then, every time I would place a partner, and let's say I've got a partner, and every year, he brings in a million dollars to his firm, because he's so good at bringing in clients. He's the, the Harvey Specter of the firm, if you will. <laughs> um, I would debrief them, and I would say, look, I just got you this great job, tell me how you built your client base. And I started gathering all this information and I found out that maybe an introverted tax attorney would go about getting clients through writing because they're not as good as shaking hands and going out and meeting people. Not social smart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was just not, not that skilled, okay? Or uh, a lot of times extroverts would go to a networking event and their goal would be to get the card of every single person in the room and I would teach them, no, the smart guys find one person who's really, truly valuable. But how do you find that one person? Well, there are ways. Uh, one thing I look for when I go to a networking event, if there's someone that other people are going out of their way to come up and show respect to and get just a few minutes with, they've got a bullseye. That's, that's a, a target for me, oh, a, a high value target. Um, I, sometimes it's as simple as, if they're wearing a $50,000 Patek Philippe watch, well, that's a pretty good clue that they're probably doing pretty well for themselves, no matter what the rest of the dress is like. Because I've got to tell you, if you've got a Patek, you're going to wear it with sneakers or a suit. Either mm -hmm. way, you're going to wear it wherever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes it's just the more ostensible you know, things that you can see. Other times, you just meet people, you talk to them, you're polite to everybody, but it's through conversation that you begin to discern someone who could be of incredible import or value to you right. from someone who wants to sell you a BMW. Right, okay? right. Not that I don't like BMWs, but well, I'm just saying yeah, that, Yeah, talking know. about those people that you see at the mixers who just constantly giving people business cards yeah. and then just not even leaving an impression, which probably is the exactly. worst quality of networking that we can think about. Yep, absolutely. I, I always tell my people, it's better to have five CEOs who know your voice the moment they pick up the phone than 5,000 V cards of people who have no idea who you are. Right, so. right. So network, and then what? Um. Well, uh, there are different ways, but uh, public speaking, 
if someone is good at public speaking and they know how to speak for client development purposes as opposed to just going and giving a speech and they know where to speak. So would you say that um, know how to kind of introduce yourself and your service as a product is more important or let people know about who you are and start actually having an impression on you first? Sure, that's a very good point. So there's a, a principle called the Pareto principle. It's the 80-20 rule, mm. okay? Uh, and so I use the 80-20 rule when I give a speech. 80% of my speech is gonna be valuable content to the audience. It's gonna show them, look, if I can give you all of this information for free or whatever you know they're paying to be there, imagine how much I know that I'm not sharing. And then 20% of it is gonna be things like, I help the homeless. We have a rescue dog and a rescue cat. So something that makes me more than just a suit. More than just a human, like a, like a human being. Yes, that makes me human yeah. to them. Exactly, exactly. So, I see. Yeah. So, um, you know, after we finish networking and finish introduction, mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, being the street smart, I believe, is um, more than that because we're talking Absolutely. about negotiation. Sure. You know, and sure. talking about negotiation, but isn't being a lawyer just about negotiating like that's what you do on quarter yep. that's yeah. what you do in yeah. general so and you don't learn at that school you can get a law degree go through seven years of school get a law degree and never have taken a single class on negotiation or mm. maybe only taken one okay uh, mm. again it, it's not required it is highly suggested I mean what young attorney wouldn't at least take the elective or optional class to on, on negotiating especially if they're gonna go into litigation or mergers and acquisitions or you know something where that's a normal part. Uh, so I teach attorneys about negotiating uh, and not theory or academia, but specific tactics that they can use. Um, I also teach them tactics they can use in their personal life. Uh, for example, let's take the DMV, okay? Uh, the DMV <laughs> is a place where people have what's called situational power. And oftentimes, uh, we run into people at the DMV who are not highly motivated to be as nice to us as they possibly can because they don't care about customer service. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're supposed to, but we've all <laughs> encountered that person. Yes. So I use a, a tactic called the reveal your humanity tactic. And when I go into the DMV or if I have to deal with the IRS or whatever it is where people have no incentive to be nice to me, I'll go in and I'll sit down or I'll call them and I'll say, look, all my friends told me that everyone at the DMV is a horrible ogre and that none of you are nice and no one's going to be nice to me. <laughs> and I'm just really hoping that I found the one exception to the rule. Can we talk for a minute? Well, this does a couple things on a psychological level. Number one, if they are a mismatcher, if they're the kind of person who you say go right, yeah. they are go, they go left. They go left, and we find, frequently find these people in such positions. Uh -huh. Their mind will mismatch the all people at the DMV are are mean. They will want to be the good one, and they want to prove it. You know, they want to show, no, I'm the good one. Right. The other thing it does is it takes away the gratification of unnecessarily exerting power and authority in a manner that's anything other than constructive. So if they are going to be mean to me or less than friendly or whatever it is, these are people who oftentimes get gratification from that. Oftentimes because the people they deal with every day are already frustrated, they make negative assumptions about them, so it's kind of a mirroring effect, okay? If I take away the gratification of when I showed him and reward them for being, no, I'll show him. I find that my interactions with people, even in the most difficult of situations, are much, much better wow. than they would have been by using that tactic. And I've got, 32 specific tactics and strategies that I teach attorneys as, as part of our program. Oh, so. so what kind of program is it? Can you? Yeah, it's, it's negotiating tactics for attorneys. So I, I wrote it, it, and actually a lot of it applies to, to any re, situation. To real life, because it sounds yeah. like, you know, it could be applied to daily life to everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, um, for example, 
when my daughter was 10 years old, we were in a store and at the time these big tennis shoes with the gold metallic lame or whatever, they were really blingy, were all the rage. And so she wanted these shoes and they were on sale for $25 or whatever. And I told her, tell you what, you see this here where it's, it's peeling off? There was just a minor little flaw, okay? I said, you need to go to the manager and negotiate the price down to $20. And if you can do that, then you can have the shoes. And she's like, Dad, this isn't one of your classes. We're in a store. And I was like, then, okay, no problem, no shoes. And she's like, oh, yeah. So then she goes over to the manager and I see her talking and she's being as cute as she can and she's pointing at the shoe. And then all of a sudden they both look over at me and they're like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we went and bought her the shoes. And again, it's just a matter of, uh, I think a lot of what I teach is not just because they don't teach it in classes. And what I've seen in classes is often what I call fluff. It's academic theory. It's a mindset. It's Probably not- Probably less useful in life. It's yeah. not as practical. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to if someone is selling their house for $300,000, and the market's a, a buyer's market, which it is not at, at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. But let's say it's a, a buyer's market. Don't be afraid to go in at 220. You're going way low. Or measure how low can I go before they get angry and say, never mind, I don't, I don't even want to deal with you. That's, that's what you have to kind of gauge. Um, if it's a seller's market, don't be afraid to hold firm or even you know price your house above what the market is and then let people come in and make an offer right at the top of the market. Right. Um, but as Americans, other than houses and cars, our culture teaches us we should never negotiate on that, anything. That actually reminds me of something um, is um, sometimes we really need to plan things out and then it seems like, you know, because right now a lot of People are telling us we just need to be the doer. Right. But I think it's not just about doing, it's about you really try to identify what is your goal in accomplishing that. Mm -hmm. And then you try to think about the, what can you do in order to actually get to your goal, which yep. is to break down and think about this is what you need to do in order to get to your final goal. You sure. know, for example, the you know the, the DMB one, right. you know, let's just say right. for instance. Go in with a plan. Correct, yeah. go in yeah. there with a plan and then next is really learning about how to negotiating. Yeah. Not just as a you know attorney, but I think also to everybody in, you know, in our daily life as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I teach the people at our firm is there are three things that you must do in business to become truly successful at something. Most people do one thing in business. High-end professionals tend to do two. Which are? And very few people do all three. The first one is work. My dad would work, mm -hmm. and then he would come home, and he would drink beer and watch TV. And that was life, and that was fine. I mean, that was middle class, Midwest America, that's what he did, okay? Uh, a lawyer or a doctor will work, and then they'll study. So the second component is study. They'll study the latest medical procedures and techniques. They'll study Sarbanes-Oxley and its impact on the law. I remember when that was written, all of a sudden everybody was very busy. Um, and so they'll study their profession and how to be good at their profession. The third thing is to think. I spend hours listening to podcasts and watching YouTube and just scouring the net for things that will inspire innovation for me. Uh, then when I find something, I'll just stop and think for a while. I keep my phone ready and I've got a email open and I'll just start dictating. And I'll dictate the ideas that I've gleaned from what I've observed. And now, whereas it used to be, if I came up with a really good idea once a month, that was great. Now I'm coming up with pages of ideas every week wow. Yes, and, and we have a saying Just at our company. Just by listening to those podcasts yep. and resources online. Yep. Do you have any specific ones that you actually would recommend to us? Uh, the ones I listen to tend to be oriented toward legal. The legal part. Right? Um, but I, I would say that there are certain things that anybody in business needs to be aware of and know about. For example, cybersecurity versus data privacy. Okay. Um, data privacy is what 
Facebook did with information. Mm -hmm. So information was given to them and they violated the privacy of that information because there was no law telling them not to. Right. Now there are laws, okay? So data privacy is what you do with information that's given to you. Cybersecurity is what you do to keep bad guys out of your computers from coming in and stealing your information. And how these things are accomplished, like if you're talking about AES-256 or whatever it is, uh, is fascinating. But you, you don't have to necessarily be an electrical engineer or, or understand all this to the degree of an expert. As a sophisticated business official, I mean, um, business person, you do at least need to have a basic or rudimentary right. understanding of that of blockchain, which is the source of fintech. And in China, it, you know, I, from what I gather, they have buildings the size of city blocks uh, running fintech. A lot of, yes. Yeah. A lot of so, um, if you're not aware of business trends of what's going on in the world of the things that are hot, like. Uh, hedge funds for cannabis. Hedge funds are Which is for, up and coming. Yeah, are, are only for the richest of all investors. Typically, if you don't have $20 million that you can write a check for, I don't know if we're going to talk to you. <laughs> you know, so when you have old white men with $20 million or $50 million or whatever writing and putting together their investments based on something like cannabis, you know that this is not the pot of the 60s. This is very different. We are finding CBD oil has serious health benefits. Uh, it's a great alternative to opioids, you know, things like that. So all of our people are actually tasked with finding what's going on in business today that people are talking about. What's the latest buzz? And that way, if I'm at a networking event mm -hmm. and someone brings up, you know, blockchain or whatever it is, I'm not the one standing there looking like a deer in the headlights going... At least you can join the conversation. Exactly. I can, my people can walk into any room with any type of business people and at least, maybe not, they, we don't pretend to know what we don't know, but we can at least carry ourselves intelligently in just about any conversation that's going to be had. You know, even though it was only like 20 minutes, but then we actually covered a lot of topics. Sure. And I would love to have you to on my show again. Sure, I would but love that. But first of all, um, would you mind let us um, let our audience know where we can find you? Of course. And also, you know, if they um, ever want to talk to you in person or acquire a service, sure. Um, tell them your website and yeah. also where they can find you. Okay. Uh, so we're here in Las Vegas, and the website address is www.sheltonsteel.com. And our office number is 702-534-0100. Thank you so much again, Frederick, for coming here to the show. Thank you. It's been and great. And we'll see you next time. Okay, okay. Thanks. Bye. Oh, don't forget to write to me about your thoughts for the show or if there's a place you'd like to see in the town or if you think your business is a real highlight of Vegas life and want it to be featured. We always do a lucky drawing among the viewers at the end of each episode and send out different surprises each week. No strings attached. So maybe you're the next lucky winner. Thanks for watching Shannon's Lifestyle. Don't go away. We'll be right back.